Hallelujah. You know, today I want to, I, I just want to spend some time talking to you. I, I really hope not to preach. I just want to talk to you a bit. I know it's your 16th anniversary, and let me first of all say congratulations. That's a great milestone. Keep going at it. Keep pressing. Uh, but one of the things that you have to understand is this. I am not with you very often. I come once in a while. And so for me to come here and just make a fickle deposit, it doesn't make sense. If I was here for a long time, I can take my time and I can, I can go through the paces and teach. But when I'm here just for one session or two sessions, I've got to release something into your life that will challenge you. You don't grow by getting the same food over and over and over again. There's some deposit God wants to put in your life to push you to think. And the more you think, the more you increase and grow. Now, now, we have to also understand something. Like my wife was saying, this God that we serve, he's an incredible God. He, he, I mean, he's inc Have you ever really sat down for a brief moment and considered the universe? Just consider what you can see with your naked eye. Just consider that for a moment. It's incredible. You know, so he, 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 I'm, I'm 58 years going on 59, and sometimes I just sit and watch people, and I... I just have to give God thanks. How in heaven's name did he come up with a man? How did he, how did he arrive at that thinking? To create a man the way he's created. Not only that, but the different species. Two Chinese don't go and have a relationship and create a black son. His son comes out Chinese. How is that? Two white people don't go have kids and decide they're going to make an Asian kid. It doesn't happen. And they want to tell us this is evolution. Can't be. It must be some extremely wise God doing all of that. But even beyond the human being, even the trees around us, the plants around us, it's incredible. Sometimes we don't, we don't stop to think about these things. But it's incredible. Amen? So my, 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 my task here this morning is to just to try to, and trust me, I, I'm not here to, you know, to show off. Or, that's not my spirit. That's not where I'm at. I, I'm not here to try to show you how much I think. That's not me. I, there, there's a rich deposit inside of my life because, not only because God has called me that way, but I apply myself. I really do. I really do. I apply myself. I sit, I study, I read. But most of us don't do that. And hence the reason why God has put within the body apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers, so that you can get something. Amen? So, so my job this morning is to try to put that on the inside of you. You know, in life, we, 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 most of our problems are due as the direct result of our perception. However we perceive things to be, it causes us to walk that way. So my thing is that we've got to get our perception right. We must have our perception line up right. You know what the Bible says in Proverbs chapter 3, 23? Proverbs 23 and verse 7. Proverbs 23. Oh my gosh. I've got a stick to give this guy. I forgot the stick on Friday. I walked with it today and I got up there and forgot it again. That is just crazy. And it doesn't happen. Now where is the stick? That is weird. Oh, yes, I have it. Please, please. Uh, and, uh, 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 and there's a word on there for Legacy Life. There's two folders. Legacy Life, open up Legacy Life, and you will see um, perspective, something on perspective. Okay? Let me tell you the name of it, please. Oh, my word. Accurate perceptions produces God suddenlies. Accurate perceptions produces God suddenlies. How did I forget that? Please, <laughs> it's incredible. It's a new season, but <laughs> it's a brand new season. Proverbs 27 and 23 and verse 7, A says, For as he thinks in his heart, so is he. So it means that a a a a our life is a direct result of how we think. And we can only think to the degree that we have put something on the inside. So if we don't put something on the inside, we won't think. And here, here, here's what I know. I said this before, let me say it again. Most human beings, we live in a cycle of thought for years. 
We live in a cycle of thought for years. And we become set in our ways. And in order for God to move us from one place to the next, some dramatic thing has to come and happen. Some awakening has to take place. Something has to shock us and get us to, wait a minute, make us think. Otherwise, we're stuck in that rut. And so that's what the word of God needs to do for us. When we come to church, when we come to service, every so often, yes, I understand, we would, we, 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 we would preach a word for a season, and over a season it makes us think a particular way, but when God wants to change that thought, or want to change that lifestyle, or want to change your perception, he will have to come in with something strange and something new. The other thing that people don't understand is this. In order to get to the next place that you have never been before, because there is a place in God that you have not been before, to get to that place, hold on here a while, it takes some risk. How many of us are risk takers? Because it means, hear me well, it means for you, you have to walk somewhere that you have not walked before. You've got to make a journey that you haven't made before. All do you know God? You're acquainted with him, but God is much bigger than your current thought. He's much bigger than what you think. And so sometimes God wants to take you up to another level, and he begins to introduce new thoughts to you. It looks like it's foreign. It sounds weird. It sounds strange because you have not been there before. And so in order to, in order, in order, in order to get to that place, you've got to take a risk. It's a lonely journey. You've got to take a risk, and you have to know that you know God. You can't depend on the God that your brother knows or your sister knows. You have to know God. And you have to be certain that you know him. Because he will call you into some strange places to do some strange things, things that you've never done before. And the journey goes like this. You make one little step and you're kind of afraid. You, 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 you walk afraid because you're not too sure what would happen. And, you've not, and, and little by little you make the step and the more you make the step and you realize you're not falling, you're not getting damaged, you're going to become stronger and stronger and stronger and stronger, and then you're going to begin to teach this stuff. Is that making sense? Yeah. Hear what Einstein said. Albert Einstein made a statement that is so interesting. He said, the significant problems we have cannot be solved at the same level of thinking we were at when we created it. Now that makes complete sense. The problems that we currently have cannot be solved with the same level of thinking that we have when we created it. It means that our thinking must change. Some new thought has to be introduced. Amen? So in order for problems to be solved, there must be a new level of perception, thereby resulting in a new level of thinking. Let me give you the definition of perception before we go further. Hear what perception means. Perception is... The act of perceiving or receiving impressions by the senses or that act or process of the mind which makes known an eternal object. In other words, the notice which the mind takes of eternal objects. It's a notion. It's an idea. The state of being affected or capable of being affected by something external. Let me go a little bit deeper into it. Perceive. It means to have knowledge or receive impressions of eternal objects through the medium or instrumentality of the senses or bodily organs. As to, for example, as to perceive light. Light hits you and you perceive the light. You perceive the color of the light. For example, cold. When cold hits you, an external force comes against you, you have the ability to perceive it's cold and to the degree of the coldness. It means to know, to understand, to observe. Till we ourselves see it with our own eyes and perceive it by our own understanding, we are in the dark. We end up in the dark because something happens and we don't have the ability to perceive what it is. So we remain in the dark. And one thing God wants to do, God has brought light. The joy of God is to bring light into every dark circumstance that you face. 
And some of us go through situations and we are in the dark because we don't know what's going on. And part of the challenge or part of the thing of being a Christian, a born again believer, who has truly touched the spirit of God, understanding comes. God is not sitting in heaven playing a trick on us and wants us to be complete idiots. God wants us to be wise. He wants us to be as wise as he is. This is the God that we, and hear me, hear me well, hear me well. Yes, it's okay. When we die, we go to heaven and we get to see him. And that's good. But you can't grow in heaven. You understand this? Growth is for planet earth. Whatsoever state you die in, that's it. Growth is for here and now. Okay, let, 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 let me just shift it a bit. For example, for example, the home. The home is a basic unit of society. And I just want to hit that spray because, you know, we've been driving around here, and my wife and I, I mean, we went somewhere, man. I'm sitting and I'm looking at these people. This place is, I mean, we have it in Canada too, eh? so, so don't think that I'm just, I'm just uh, ill-speaking Orlando. We have it in Canada also. I was completely stunned and I was completely shocked when I moved from Trinidad to Canada and in a, in, in a, in a cab, and I'm driving behind two guys get out of a cab, a car, one with roses, handing to the other one, and they lock lips on the street. I almost fainted. That was like a culture shock for me. I was, what? I mean, I came from Trinidad. I don't know if it's happening in Trinidad. No, of course they may have, had, may, may, may have these kind of people in Trinidad, but I've never seen that in my life. 20 years ago, I was completely stunned. And it still happens. And I, I, I want to confirm that spirit a little bit here. Because I know I'm preaching to you, yes, but I'm also preaching to the spirit realm of this region. And I just want to confirm, the home is a basic unit of society. Now, let me say this. The atom is a basic unit of the universe. In any atom, in any basic element, protons, and neutrons and electrons are in balance with one another. There are positive and negative forces working here. The point is this. If you reach in there and take out one of them, okay, and you put something else on the inside, you have completely changed the balance of the atom and the universe is no longer in existence. Whether you believe in God or not, whether we believe in God or not, the simple fact is that we live on planet Earth, and the reason why we live on Earth is because everything is in balance. Regardless of who created it, regardless of where it comes from, we don't have to be a Christian to believe this. The fact is that we live it every day. It's in complete balance. For example, water that we drink and we live is made up of what? Two parts hydrogen and one part oxygen. That is water. You don't have to be a Christian to believe that. You drink water. And I'm speaking to the atmosphere. Everybody in Orlando drinks water. It's two parts hydrogen and one part oxygen. If you decide, okay, I'm going to put two parts hydrogen and two parts oxygen, you make a completely different substance. It is liquid, but it's called hydrogen peroxide. And if you drink too much of that, what will happen? It will kill you. Okay, so let's, let's, let's push that thought a bit further. The home is the basic unit of society. Whether you're a Christian or not, it's the basic. And how is the home made up? The home is made up of one part man, one part woman that comes together and in that union produces a child. You break that cycle and you decide that I will take out one part woman and put in another part man, and somehow give them some kids, and make a family, and make a home, you're going to run into problems. And this is not a Christian principle. This is a life principle. This is a life principle. Eventually, hear what I'm telling you, eventually, this whole gay agenda is going to blow up. It's going to blow up. Because you know what? It's as old as the planet. It's nothing new. It's old. And God is going to blow this up because you cannot, you cannot go against what he has built. You can't. You just can't do it. You can't do it. You can't do it. 
So God in his divine pattern has provided a system of checks and balances for the home as well as the local church. There are certain components that make up a local church. And you break that order, you're going to get messed up. God wants his church to be in order. Amen? All right, let's go to page three. The moment of crisis. Hallelujah. How much time do I have this morning, Apostle? Now, crisis is defined as the point in time when it is to be decided whether an affair or a course of action must go on or be modified or be terminated. In essence, the moment of crisis is known as what we call the turning point. There comes a turning point where you have to make a decision. Hallelujah. In medical terms, it is, it is described as that point of change in a disease or situation which indicates whether the result of any particular course of action would result in recovery or death. Now understand something here. Here's one of the problems we have. The, the script here was not written in Western English. Not only was it not written in Western English, it wasn't written in a 21st century mindset. It was written in Hebrew and in Greek, not only Hebrew and Greek, but with an old mindset. And back then when it was being written, that old mindset to them was new. And for us now to try to take the script here and bring it into a 21st century mindset and believe that God wrote it to us, we're in trouble. So this is why it's so important when we're reading the scriptures to try to understand the culture of the day, to understand what drove their thinking, to understand what made God talk to them the way he spoke to them. So, so in this particular instance, a, a turning point or a crisis, the, the, the imagery that you have to have is like a Hebrew woman pregnant, because when she was pregnant back thousands of years ago, there were no hospitals like we have today. There were no IV that they put into their arm. There was nothing to in, in, induce labor. When they're pregnant and the time came for delivery, they had a little, a, little, a little stool they make with a hole, and the woman would squat over the stool and push for the baby to come. There was no medication to help her. She had to push. So there came a moment in time in that woman's life, and you hear me, Hobra Hikrada Masambroski. Two things happening at the same time. She's in a moment of chaos because her body is going through something that it never went through before. This is her first baby. It's, it's contorting. It's going through pressure. She's trying to push this baby or not. She has to make a decision. Whether I give up or whether I take this thing through to the end. So she's in a moment of crisis. There's a turning point. There's a, there's a, there's a point in her life where a decision has to be made. If she makes the right decision, hear me well, and she goes through that chaotic period, bang, joy comes because a baby comes out. The pain may last for a while, but if she passes through that pain, if she passes through that rigor, a baby is born and everyone is happy. That's the imagery that we have to have, amen? So in a crisis situation, the believer, there's always an opportunity for significant discovery and breakthrough. So don't look at your troubles as well the devil tempting you and the devil pressure. A lot of times, God is the one who is taking you through that situation to give you the opportunity for great joy. Great joy cannot come if there is not great breakthrough. So a lot of times, the obstacles that keep coming against you and keep pressing against you, it's not the devil. Yeah, we are children of God. Yeah, we are children of God. When we were in the world, the devil had all this play upon us. But now that we are children of God, God has the authority over our lives. Nothing can happen to you and I without his explicit uh, uh, consent. He must consent. Un hear me. 
Uh, let, let me go so far as to say that, and I've got to be careful how I say this. Yes, if you sit and mess up, you may have to go through certain things to deal with that, to correct you. But even in that, it's not the devil. If you sin and if you mess up, God is the one who will chastise you. Whatever methods he uses, he will chastise. As a child of God, the devil is not your problem anymore. The moment we accepted Jesus Christ and put the devil down, he's no longer a problem. Even when you're going through chastisement, it's God is the one who's whipping you. But this is what he said. If you're a true son, a true son receives chastisement. So sometimes father will whip you to get you in shape. Sometimes father will whip you to get you in shape. The enemy always wants us to focus on the challenge and not the divine opportunity. Especially out here in the West. Life has become so easy and so ridiculously nice. The moment a challenge comes, we're out of here. The moment any kind of pressure blows in, we're gone. The moment any opposition hits us, I'm done with this. We're not realizing that, wait a minute, right in the midst of that pressure and trial is a divine opportunity to see God show up in your life. Now, Jesus gives us a powerful example, and I want to look at that example. A powerful example of this, and while we all know this particular script here, I want to briefly, I want to briefly revisit his crisis moment. Tell me to Luke chapter 22. You can read the whole of Luke 22, but I'm going to read from verses 36 through 46, 39 through 46. Luke 22, 39 through 46. And we all know the script here. Hear what it says. Coming out, he went to the Mount of Olives, and as he was accustomed, he and his disciples also followed him. And his disciples also followed him. Verse 40. When he came to the place, he said to them, Pray that you may not enter into temptation. And he was withdrawn from them about a stone's throw. And he knelt down and prayed, saying, Father, if it is your will, take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Then an angel appeared to him from heaven, strengthening him. And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly. Then his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down to the ground. When he rose up from prayer and had come to his disciples, he found them sleeping from sorrow. Then he said to them, why do you sleep? Rise and pray lest you enter into temptation. Now, this is incredible because Jesus has gone to pray to the Father. He knows that his time is coming to be crucified. He knows what is going on with him. His disciples doesn't. He goes to pray. And while he's in that intense prayer, he is sweating blood. Drips of blood is coming down from him. Now, he has a decision to make. He's in a moment of crisis. He has a decision to make. This is the first time he's praying with that intensity, and the intensity is driving blood out of his body as sweat. He has a decision to make. As a matter of fact, the decision almost caught up with him. He said, Lord, if it be possible, end this. If it be possible, I can't take this anymore. If it is at all possible, please end it. For a brief moment, it almost shattered him, and he would have stopped. But then he said, no, no, hold on here a while. Let me back up. I can't think that way. Even though I'm going through this intense agony, I have not re yet reached the point of joy. I'm going through this intense agony. Not my will, but your will be done. I'll go through it. Now, which one of us have gone through that intensity? None of us. Sometimes we need to tell members in our church, when they come to tell us all kind of craziness and they want to go, I ask them that question, have you yet gotten to the point where you're dripping blood when you pray? Have you reached the position of intensity when you kneel down to pray about this situation, blood begins to ooze from your veins? No, well then sit. None of us 
have ever faced that level of intensity. And Jesus decided, I'm not going to quit. I'm not giving up. I'm not pulling the plug. I'm going to press through this to the very end. I am going to go to the cross. Regardless of what happens, I am going to the cross. Many of us would have given up. The moment we begin to see blood oozing out of our veins, we would give up this pressure. It's too much. I'm done with this. I'm out of here. But not Jesus. He went to the very end. That's the kind of spirit that we need within the context of the church. Men and women who will press through regardless of what happens. I'm with you to the end. I'm going to press through. Oh yeah, we want a sudden leap from God. We want a sudden leap from God. But God does not waste his suddenlies. He's not a cheap God. The suddenly will come when you're under an intense situation that requires a sudden leap from God. Huh? Oh, suddenlies have to be earned. You see, we, we, we can't produce a suddenly, but we could earn it. There's nothing within our makeup that could make us produce a suddenly. We need God to produce a suddenly. But we've got to give him something to work with. The children of Israel, they were not a lot. Remember them? It started out with Joseph. He was sold into slavery by his brothers. He could have quit. Ended up in the land of Egypt. You can read Genesis chapter 37. He labors in the land. And eventually a nation is born out of him. They ended up being slaves to build Pharaoh's kingdom. That was until Almighty God decided that enough was enough. And he gave them a suddenly. <laughs> oh, you could read that story. He gave them a suddenly. They get 40 years wages. <laughs> One sudden move, God just decided, I'm just going to give them everything one time. They went through all the pressure. They were slaves in Egypt. They built his kingdom. Nobody ran. And then in one swoop of a night, God blessed them. Amen? They had to face the rigors of life in the wilderness. Dealing with one crisis situation after another. In all of them, they saw the mighty hand of God turn up for them. And we all know they were en route to the land of promise. And when they eventually got there, they encountered seven nations more mightier than them. And they had to literally fight and displace those nations to get their own land. God, listen, God promised them this land. That was their promised land. God promised them. You know, it's funny. It's, it's very, I laugh at these things. All God promised you this thing. In blessing, I will bless you. I will make you. And when you step into your blessing, there are seven nations mightier than you, giants. <laughs> How do you deal with that? You, 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 you will curse and say, that's the devil. God hasn't really blessed me. If he blessed me, how come there are giants in the land? How come we have all these ice to contend with? This can't be God's land. You all realize something in the natural? You know, you know we, Sandra and I were laughing at this uh, yesterday. Understand something. Who is an American? Let me tease you a bit. Who is an American? Hmm? <laughs> Say it again. Say it again. Those who were born and raised here is an American, okay? But let me ask you a question. What is the seed of that person who was born and raised here? The point I'm making is this. For most people living in America, they came here. They came here. So why... <laughs> Anyway, let me leave that. Let me leave. Let me leave that alone. I don't. Let me. Let me just pull myself away from that point. That's just gonna go crazy. Let me just leave. Let me leave that alone. Let me leave it alone. Let me leave it alone. But you, you all understand something? The the, 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 the the people who occupied here were called American 
Indians, talk to me. And in order for this land to be taken, they had to be driven out. Every possible piece of land that you get is by, a, is by conquest. Somebody mightier than you comes and take it. That's how God has ordained it. God, nothing comes easy. The point I'm trying to make, nothing comes easy. But even though God has promised you it, this is your land, you have to go and fight for it. Go with the word of the Lord. God has given me this thing. God is the one who has entrusted this to me. Get out. Drive them out. You know, let me leave that. It's according to perspective. You see, if your perspective is wrong, you'll never drive them out. No, I'm telling you, Apostle, it's so true, but people don't see this. Everybody is an immigrant. <laughs> oh, and then we pride ourselves in being an American. Where they came from? Tell me about that, brother. And we pride ourselves in being an American. Who really is an American? And which one of us, griping on the Spanish that comes in, or whoever comes in, griping on them, and say, well, you're not an American, get out. But then if you check your ancestral roots, your parents came from Poland or Russia or, or, or somewhere in Europe or whatever the case may be, and they had you here. So give the people a chance. Because, because <laughs> yeah, I mean, <laughs> Hey, I don't know why I get onto this line. You know, please, let me just get off. Don't, don't, don't encourage me. Let's go. Let's get back. We'll be talking about the children of Israel. Let's come back to the children of Israel. So they got into this land, seven giants more mighty than them, but they had the word of the Lord. We met you here, but the God of heaven, the one who created this earth, has sent us to take this territory. Now get out. Go. You could say where well, God is unjust. You could say where well, God is unfair. Because there were seven nations living in the promised land, not only living, but they raised the promised land up. The grapes were so big, the pomegranate, everything was so powerful and nice. They're the one who cultivated it. And then God says, get out. I have given this to my people. Go. And they drove them out of the land. You've got some land to take. You've got some spiritual territory to take. Well, there may be some giants living on the inside of it. Rise up, mighty man of God. Storm that territory and let the kingdom of God give that land to you. Now, you understand something? Because even within the context of the children of Israel, there were two, because, you hear me, millions of people came out of Egypt going into the promised land. We know some died off in the wilderness. But some entered into the promised land, but there were only two had the correct perspective. Just one Caleb. They saw things differently. And because they saw things differently, God blessed them. We want to have that same spirit. We want to have that same different spirit. Amen? Hallelujah. Let me quickly get on because if I don't stop, I, I'll just, you know, I'll just, I'll just, you know, uh, for, 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 for example, you know, within the last couple of years, if last few years, I have been on a quest because I came into this whole preterist teaching. So I was on a quest. I had to go and check it out. I had to go dig and search with my wife there. Many nights I don't sleep because I'm digging the woods. To, I'm checking this thing out. I'm going. God had literally break my concept. Let me think. Trying to figure out what really happened. And I'll tell you something. I'm not going to tell you where I arrived at, but I'll say this to you. It is so vitally important when you're reading this Bible, read it like as though you had a mind 2,000 years ago. Don't ever read it as though it's for today. Scriptures wasn't written for us. I mean, it wasn't written to us. It was written for us. But it was written to people back in the first century. And it's so important to understand that. We've got to try to understand what they understood and what they heard. And, and, and let, me, let, me, let, me, let me, I'm just going to, this is going to be a little detour. For example, Jesus made certain statements. If you read the Bible, Jesus makes, some of you standing here would not see death until you see the Son of Man coming. 
For years, I tried to figure out how could that mean us here in the 21st century? What would those, what, what would those people standing there listening to Jesus himself talking, prophesy, receive? Think about that. Not only that, but this is Jesus prophesying. If Jesus is prophesying, are we saying the word that he prophesied back then, hold on, didn't come to pass in that time, and it's for us today, then we make Jesus a liar. Think about that for a little bit. We make him a liar. When he says, some of you standing here, he's not putting that down 2,000 years away. He's talking about people standing right there, his friends, in his age, in his region. In his some of you standing here will not see death. Two things that we can conclude. Either the translation is wrong or Jesus missed it. And if, hear me, I'm going to take you a bit. If the translation is completely wrong, then we're in trouble. Because then it means how much of the Bible then is really real. If one thing is wrong, then we have to question everything else. But let's go one step further. If Jesus is wrong... And if the apostles are wrong, then we're in significant trouble. How then could we believe? The fact of the matter is, is that we have to take the scripture for what the scripture says. We've got to believe the scripture for what it says. Anyway, let me get, let me get back. So accurate perception is vital. Let me get on because if I don't, I'll, I'll just miss everything up here. So I believe the church is where she is today because of incorrect perceptions. And God is trying to adjust our perceptions. Amen? I want to give you a story from 2 Kings chapter 6. 2 Kings chapter 6. Let me quickly go on. 2 Kings chapter 6. I want to be from verses 15 through 20. Verse 15 says, And the servant of the man of God arose early and went out, and behold, an army surrounded the city, and horses and chariots. And his servant said to him, Alas, my master, what shall we do? And he answered, do not fear, for those with us are more than those with them. And Elijah prayed and said, I pray you, Jehovah, open his eyes, so that he may see. And Jehovah opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw, and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots, of fire round about Elisha. And they came down to it. And Elisha prayed to Jehovah and said, I pray you, strike these people with blindness. And he struck them with blindness, according to the word of Elisha. And Elisha said to them, this is not the way, nor is this the city. Follow me, and I will bring you to the man whom you seek. But he led them to Samaria. And it happened, when he came into Samaria, Elisha said, Jehovah, open the eyes of these men so that they may see. And Jehovah opened their eyes, and they saw. And behold, they were in the middle of Samaria. My point is this. Two men. This is real. This is not an imaginary thing. Two men in the same situation. One is a prophet, and one is the servant of the prophet. Both men are spiritual. Okay? An army surrounded them. One guy, or both guys, saw the physical army. There was an army. They saw the physical army. That moved up, by seeing that, it pushed them to a particular course of action. The servant, his course of action was fear. There's a mighty army surrounding us. Elisha, the prophet, he saw the army, yes. But his eyes went deeper than just the natural. He saw into the spirit realm. And beyond that army, he saw a mighty army of angels surrounding them. His course of action is not run. I will not flee. What we need to get, and I pray God that this thing filters into this church like never before. May your eyes be open to the spirit realm. The spirit realm is real. Trust me, it is real, it is real, it is real, it is real. God wants to take you on a journey. It is real. Many of us will faint if an angel appeared to us. But when you read the scripture, New Testament scripture, that was a natural occurrence. It was normal. You remember one time Peter was in jail? 
and, 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 and the gate was loose and Peter came out and when the damsel came to the gate, she thought it was Peter's angel. You, you, have you all read that? Angel is a normal occurrence. So we have to understand that, wait a minute, there is a world beyond this world which we see. We cannot be moved by what we see. We've got to look into the realm that is unseen. But too many of us, especially out here in North America and Europe, we are bound by what we see. We are moved by what we see. Our eyes are locked into the natural, and our spiritual eyes have not yet been turned on. May God remove the veil. May he remove the veil. May the veil be removed. May that veil be removed. May your perceptions change about who God is. God is spirit. Too many of us think that this God is spirit is somewhere way out there in heaven that we can't even reach. God is spirit right here and right now. He's with you here and now. The spirit realm is not hard to enter into. In him we move and live and have our very being, the very breath that we take. It becomes life. There is a new life inside of us. And just like how we lived in the old life, we can now live in this new life. Oh, Holy Ghost. Go a bit lower down. Go to page number eight. So these two men had the same experience. One saw a natural army. The other saw both the natural army and the spiritual army. Could I say this to you? That there are angels right around here? Could I say this to you that you don't ever go anywhere alone? Could I say this to you? There's always a heavenly presence with you. This is what the Bible says. I will give my angel charge over you. I put a hedge of protection round about you. Have you ever seen that hedge? There is a hedge of protection around you. Amen? So two men saw the same natural event, but one man had a further eyesight. He went into the spirit realm. So let's ask me, let me ask you a question. This leads me to ask you these questions. What determines one's perception? What determines your perception? What is your current perception about the church, about the kingdom, about life? What is your current perception? Is it causing you to be limited by fear, insecurity, etc.? Or are you being empowered and being confident? Your perception changes all of that. However you perceive life, that's how you're going to respond. If you, if, if, if you perceive life wrongly as a believer, you will respond with fear, intimidation, uncertainty. But if you perceive life from the spiritual realm, you will pro progress confidently. Uh, people, people want to know, wh wh what's wrong with you? I mean, for example, we have gone through all kinds of stuff. And people are wrong us, but, but how come you can be still so happy? Because my perspective is correct. It is correct. <laughs> oh my God. You know what's happening to me? I've got so much more to preach and so much more to teach, but I'm feeling like as though the anointing is beginning to shut down. Yeah, I'm telling you. Oh, Holy Ghost. Oh, precious Holy Ghost. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. 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 Thank you. Thank you, living God. Thank you, living Christ. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. 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 Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, living God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Holy Ghost. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Ah, bro, sambra, sato, raba, him, broskita, raba, hum, breskete, ki. Limbro, mati, rabo, bre, hete, raba, ba, ma, mato, raba, dom, rahita, ba, sambroski. Limbro, tabilam, broski, le, rahata, raba, da. So if there's anything that I can shift inside of your mind this morning, let me say this to you. Make sure your perceptions are correct. If you need an adjustment, 
this is the best time to ask God. And I guarantee you, your sudden leaves will come. If you give God that, he will produce sudden leaves for you. Amen? You're going to bear with me. This is, this, this is just how I flow. I mean, if the anointing shuts down, I'm going to stop. Maybe because not, I'm, I'm, I'm not just here to preach, to preach for preaching's sake. If the anointing starts to, to, to wind down, I'm just going to stop. If it, if, it, if it happens to me in the middle of a sentence, I'm just going to stop. Amen? So let me encourage you, please. Check your perceptions. Take this word. Allow it to sink on the inside of you. Think and rethink. Let new thoughts begin to come into your mind. May God invade your thoughts. May, may he come into your thoughts and push the boundaries of your mind. May he stretch you a bit. May he press you a bit and stretch you a bit. That's the only way that we grow. We can only grow to the degree that we are stretched. And God will stretch us so much and then stop. And let us get accustomed to that realm of stretching. And when we get accustomed to that realm of stretching, he's going to stretch us again. So for the Christian, for the, for the Christian journey, it's a journey of stretch, relax, live. Stretch, Relax, live. Stretch, relax. You know, it's like a bodybuilder. Have you ever seen all those bodybuilders build their body? Yeah? A bodybuilder building his body to get muscles, don't just lift little weights. He, he challenges himself with weights that are heavier than him sometimes. And he pushes himself. I believe that God wants you to do some heavy lifting. And as you do it, God is going to expand you. You, you see, in the natural, you may look, you may, you, you may look, you, you, you may look slim and swan in the natural, but in the spirit, you got muscles. You got some, you got a punch in the spirit. God wants you to have a punch, amen. So when you rise up to begin to pray, and you rise up to begin to decree, and you rise up to begin to declare, and you rise up to begin to prophesy, as you begin to open your mouth, what comes out from the inside of you? No one. Be like the iceberg. Be like the iceberg. What people see is just one-tenth of who you are. There's a massive, colossal weight down on the inside that nobody sees. But when they run into you, bro, when they run into you, they come up against this heavy object on the inside. May the internal fortitude of your life be strong and great. Grow on the inside. Grow on the inside. Grow on the inside. As a man thinketh, in his heart, so is he. Your direct results of your thinking, your direct result of how you think. May God invade your thoughts. And may he give you a change in thinking. Think differently. And as you think differently, you will experience God in different dimensions. May God cause an avalanche of life to flow down into this church. You know, you know, I, I, I say this to you. Right here, in the midst of this anointing, I want to pray for this man. I want to pray for him that his foot be completely healed and he be delivered from whatever it is. Come, my brother, come. Rema, right here in the midst of this anointing. Let's just stretch our hands out towards your pastor. Father, I lay hands upon your son. I thank you for this warrior. I thank you for this champion. I thank you for this man of God. And Father, today we ask you, shift. 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 Father, we declare to him today that diabetes be no more. We break that cycle. We break that cycle. And Father God, by your power and by your strength, descend upon him. And heal him, God, not only in his toe, but from the crown of his head right down to his toe. God, may he experience the joy of complete deliverance in his foot. God, there's already, you know, Ibra, there's, all, there's already a warrior on the inside of this man. There's already a champion on the inside of this man. Now God, let it manifest, let it manifest right out through his body. That healing result. And God, you know what I know? I know that he knows. He believes in healing. He knows that you're a God that heals. And God, there is no reason why this day you wouldn't come down and deliver him. So I pronounce upon him health. 
I pronounce upon him renewed vitality. I pronounce upon him, God, a new season of joy and strength. And so I bless him today. And I thank you in Jesus' almighty name. Hallelujah. 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 Thank you, Holy Ghost. Thank you, Holy Ghost. Thank you, Holy Ghost. Rabom Rahika Dabrahasa. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let me just share one more thing with you. You remember Christopher Columbus? Christopher Columbus lived in a time when men thought the earth was flat. He lived in a time like that. And nobody would venture too far into the sea because they believed the earth was flat. And if you go too far, their perception was is that you would fall off. A thought hit Christopher Columbus, this can't be. The earth is not flat, it's wrong. And he began to challenge the people's mindset. Nobody wanted to believe him. And so Christopher Columbus said, you know what? I'm going to get some guys and I'm going to go make a journey. And he made a journey and he didn't fall off the earth. And that's how we come today to enjoy the benefits of our own earth. Your perception, if it changes, it will push you to go into new realms. It will push you to challenge. It will push you to make steps which nobody else wants to make. I want to pronounce upon legacy life that same kind of spirit. Begin to make the journey, brother. Make it, make it, make it. Be the arm bearer. Be the one who steps in front. Be the, be the leader. Be the champion. Keep climbing. Keep going for more God. May God release upon you a new strength that this house may continue to grow and increase. In Jesus' almighty name. But I'm done. Amen. Amen.